Good morning. It's good to see everybody who's out and about with us this morning as we think about when the Lord is called up yonder, that should be one of the things that, that motivates our life is the one I hear our name called up there. You know, when we start thinking about our life on this earth, there's many times we want to be a part of something. We want to be a part of something great and grand, and we really want something great to come of our lives, and yet the only thing that really matters is hearing the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. How great a day it will be when we get to hear that. Have you ever sat and thought about that most people have some kind of fear? Some people have some kind of fear and it motivates them to act in a certain way or it keeps them from being uh, who they need to be because they're so afraid of something that may not ever happen. I mean, when you sit and think about it, the greatest fears that we have have not happened to us yet. That's why we're still afraid that they might happen to us, and they keep us, uh, keep us at bay. They kind of keep us, you know, watching our tracks and keep us from going to certain places and saying certain things. For lack of being able to pronounce the word, have you ever looked up the word that means the fear of long words? That word is you know, it's ginormous. Why would you use such a word to describe something people are afraid of? I don't understand it. See, when we start thinking about fear. Fear is something that even though we have it, we cannot allow it to control us. And we cannot allow it to keep us from being who we need to be or doing the things that we need to do. It shouldn't reign over us and keep us pinned down. And yet we should rule over our fears. And and we think about this, this idea of being fearful. I want to think about three things this morning. Three things this morning that sometimes keeps us afraid keeps us dreadfully fear, fearful. And as we talk about those three things, I want us to, to look at what the Bible says and how to relieve those things. Because really when we sit down and think about the things that we're afraid of, there's something we cannot control. And yet, there's an answer to every single fear that we have. The, the first fear I want us to think about this morning is the fear of failure. The fear of sin. Uh, the fear of missing heaven. See, when we look at our Bibles, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, we we find there that, that our sins and our trespasses or transgressions, they separate us from God. And if we're not careful, we, we focus directly on that, just that idea of being separated, that the God and, and God and us don't, don't have communion together. We're, God is so infinitely better than we are, and we're infinitesimally small. We're just so small that we can never be like God or be, you know, be even close to where God is. And yet... God has made a way. See, when we turn our Bibles to the book of Romans, there's three places here I want us to remember, things I want us to think about when we think about our sins, and our sins eternally separating us or keeping us from where the Father is. And, and in thinking about these things, it should give us hope. Hope for the brighter day. We do not have to dreadfully be afraid because there are times that we have sinned. So we're going to turn our Bibles over to Romans in chapter 6. What Paul does here is he describes how we've been freed from our sins through our baptism. We, the old person has died and was buried, but yet we rose into a newness of life. And I want us to, to look at what he says in verse 7. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Freed from the clutches of sin, if you will, clean, clean, uh, we are freed from the, the rule of sin, if you will. We are free from the consequences of past sins. See, sin doesn't rule over us anymore once we have those sins washed away. We are desire. See, when we repent, we say, I don't want to live like, life like that anymore. I can live a different way. And so once the old person has been baptized, we raise up to a newness of life, and we're free from all those things. Now, that doesn't mean those things don't want to try to come back. It doesn't mean the sinful desires don't try to get a foothold in our life. What I am saying is that through our baptism, that we've been separated from our past sins. There has been a cutting off. That's how Paul talks about it in Colossians in chapter 2. And so we don't have to be fearful of all those things in the past. Jesus has taken care of all those things. He has given us a newness of life. See, we're going to turn our Bibles over to, to Romans in chapter 7 and and what we start coming to a, a coming into contact with is, is this idea of a struggle. 
And whether Paul is describing this about himself or with the nation of Israel, I really don't feel it makes much of a difference. And this is what he says. Notice what he starts saying in verse 15. For what I am doing I do not understand. For what I will, not, for what I will to do that I do not practice. But what I hate that I do. If I then do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. And the idea with this is that struggle of sin. Have you ever been in a position where you said, I don't want to commit that sin ever again, and yet before long you're looking and it's exactly what you're doing. And you say, I don't want to do that no more. And you sat down and said, you know, I really want to live life this way. I, I really want to turn over a new leaf. And I want to start doing these things. And yet you look in your life and you find out you're not doing them. So it's a struggle, isn't it? And Paul, what Paul is talking about is describing is that same type of struggle. There are good and wholesome things, things that God wants us to do, and if we're not careful, we find ourselves not doing them. And there are sinful things that God doesn't want us to do, and if we're not careful, we find ourselves doing those. It's that struggle. Notice what he says starting in verse 23. But I see another law of my members warring against the law of my, of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who would deliver me from this body of death? I thank God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I will serve the law of the God, and with the flesh the law of sin. And the idea there isn't so much that he's going to continue in sin, that's, that's not it. But he's going to grow in his desire to follow what God says. And turn away from those things. See, if we sat here, if I stood here and said, you'll never have to struggle with sin ever again in your life, I'd be a liar. That's not true. That absolutely isn't true. Because the old man, the old woman wants to come back. But we've got to keep them at bay. Notice what he says, starting in the 8th in the chapter, starting in verse 1. And if you're one of those circling, highlighting type people, those that like to take notes, notice this. There is therefore now no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of, of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. See, there's been a, again, we don't have to worry about those past sins or this past lifestyle. There's a newness. There's a newness in Christ. There's no condemnation found in Jesus. Have we sat down and really thought about that? And the things that we find out that we're not doing, that we beat ourselves up over, Jesus isn't condemning us, but we are doing that. We are just to live according to his will. We are just to, to follow what he says to do. It's living. It's living. Notice what he says in Romans chapter 8. Notice how he puts this. We'll start reading in verse 31. For what shall I say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It, it is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God? Who makes intercession for us? Now really look at those ideas. As we live according to what God wants, and as we continue to change, and as we continue to draw near, and as we continue to want to do what is right, and we continue to turn away from what is wrong, and turn away from those sinful things, who is it that's going to charge us with a crime? Who's going to lay sin on our account? Who is it that's going to look and say, you're not good enough? It's not God. What did God say? I sent my son to die for you. I sent my son to die for you. I have made a way. See, if it's God who's the one that says he has made a way, who are we or anybody to say there's no way or that we're not on the right way if we're following God? See, no one can say that because God is the one that justifies. God is the one that sent his son. God is the one who made a way when there was no way so we can come back in a relationship with him. God made that happen. We didn't make that happen. And neither can we take that away. God did that. Notice how it goes on. 
Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword? As it is written, for your, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is nothing, nothing can make God not love you. Nothing can, will make God say, you know, they're just not, they're not, I don't know, the sacrifice is for everybody but them. No, it doesn't work like that. If God has made a way, and he has given that way and given us the word so we can understand and we can obey and we can, we can apply, then no one can say there's no way. Sin doesn't have a hold on us anymore. We don't have to worry about failing. We don't have to worry about being good enough. All we have to worry about is being faithful. And being faithful doesn't mean perfect. Being faithful says, I'm following the Lord and that's where I'm going. It doesn't matter if anybody else is coming. That's where I'm going. And if we have the attitude and we have that life, guess what? Sin doesn't have a hold on us anymore because there's no condemnation in him. See, there, there are many people who have this fear over their sin, whether it be and even their past sin that's been washed away. Or failure, they're not going to be able to complete the race, the, the Christian life that we're called to live. Well, I'm telling you, the life that we have is in Jesus, and it can't be taken away in Him. And so we don't have to fear those things. We don't have to fear those things. What do we got to do? We just got to live. We gotta live the things that we believe. We put our sights on heaven and we live to make it our home. Not that we ever earn it, but we're gonna have a whole life changing, a whole life of change. See, that's the thing we gotta remember: is that living a Christian life, the sanctification or the being set apart, is a process. None of us are exactly who we are, who we need to be today. And if the Apostle Paul can say that he's not yet obtained heaven, I can say I'm in good company, can't you? But what did he do? He pressed on, forgetting those things that are behind and pressed forward to the upper calling of Christ Jesus. See, that's what we got to focus on. Not our sin. Not the times we fail. Not the times we're not who we need to be. We focus on what we have in Jesus. And we live for him. See, that's it. That's it. Fear of others. Fear of others. See, that's the second fear. What will others say? Do you realize there are some people who are not who they want to be because of their fear of others? There are people who want to start businesses and have big careers and they have big goals and, and they want to shoot for the moon, but because of what other people have said, they don't do it. They're miserable. They have the idea, they have the want to, but the fear of what somebody would say, they don't. See, following Jesus is exactly the same way. There are people who, who are afraid to follow Jesus because of what their friends will say or what their, because their family will say or what their co-workers will say, what their schoolmates will say. What, they, it, they get so wrapped up in what other people think. They forget to think about what God, what God wants and what God says. See, we can turn our Bibles. Let's, let's go to 1 Peter 3 first. And what we do, and what I want us to do is, I want us to think about this, this having our mind not set so much on what others think and feel about us, but really set our mind and our hope on what God thinks about us. See, notice what he says here. In First, first Peter chapter 3, we're going to start reading in verse 15. He says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks a reason for, for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. 
For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Now notice some things that, I, I, that what Peter is giving us. He says, sanctify the Lord God in your heart always. And the idea is put aside a place that only he can be. Set aside a place in your heart that only God is. Nothing else can touch him. But that's where he is. And be ready to give a defense. The idea of defense, it comes from a word that says give a reason for what you believe. It's not that you're a defense attorney. It's not that you've got to argue and fuss and fight with people. That's not it. When somebody says, why do you believe that? Tell them why you believe it. That's something we prepare beforehand. You say, I believe it because of this, and I believe it because of that. Why are you nice to people when they're not, not nice to you? Because that's who I should be. Why do you go to church two times on Sunday? Because that's who I am. That's, how, that's where I go when I worship with my brothers and sisters. I, I worship God together with Him. And we say to some, we just have something to say. And it's not that we're trying to condemn people when they don't live that way. It says, this is why I live this way. This is why. And live a life in such a way when they talk bad about you, they're ashamed. And it's like this. And when, when people, when the Pharisees wanted to, to put Jesus on trial and have him crucified, what were the things that they brought up against him? He healed people and he claimed to be the son of God. What evil did he do? He didn't do any evil. They had nothing to say. Even the false witnesses couldn't agree on, on what, he, what he deserved. And so you look at these and say, well, what is, what is that? And the idea is, when we live the way we ought to live, when people talk bad and negative about us, it's not on us. It's on them. See, we're so afraid of what other people think, and we can't control what they think. We don't have that ability to control what they think or what they feel about us. We don't have that ability. We just don't give them a reason to doubt we are who we say we are. See, that's the thing. That's the thing. Matthew chapter 10. Here Jesus is getting ready to send out the, the 72 and what's called the limited commission. Here he's talking to the the 12, and there's some things that we need to, to look at and take note of, notice of because Jesus is telling them the exact same thing. He's telling them they're going to think about them. The, the people, the audience, whoever they go talk to is going to think about them like they think about Jesus. Notice what he says in Matthew 10, 25, or 24. He says, A disciple is not above his master, nor a servant above... Uh, a, the disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher, and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? Therefore do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, and hidden that will not be made known. And when you think, think about that, they claim that Jesus was casting out demons by the Lord of the demons. He said, that's not true. How can he do that? What good would it be? If they said that about Jesus, they're going to say it about the disciples. As we follow Jesus today, guess what? They're going to say that about us. Because they would say that about Jesus. It's not that they don't like us and they're afraid of us or they just really want to tear us down. They don't like the message. They don't like the one we're following. Because they don't like Jesus, they're not going to uphold us. But what's more important? What's the most important? Notice what he says in verse, in verse 27. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And the first part is don't be dreadfully afraid of what people will say about you. That's what the first fear means. The second fear means have a respect for what God says. Have a respect for him. Because the worst somebody can do here on earth is just kill you. That's the worst they can do. But what could God do? 
And so we cannot allow the thoughts and feelings and expressions of others keep us from being who we say we are. And after all, who was with Paul when he was on trial? Jesus was. When Paul was when Saul of Tarsus was persecuting the Christians, Jesus took it personally. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, he was persecuting Christians. Jesus took it personal. See, our love and respect and honor of him should motivate what we do. The fear of what other people may say and how they may treat us should pale in that comparison. You cannot be afraid of other people. A third thing this morning is the fear of death. The fear of death. Yesterday morning I had a there was a, there was a lady who called me last last week, two weeks ago, and she said, My my sister, my sister is going to die. And she says, I don't know anybody. I've talked to you a long time ago. You must not talk to me because a long time ago I wasn't here. And I told her I was only here last, since you know last last year. And she said, well, we still hold the funeral services because I, I don't know anybody else. And, and, I, and, I, and most often when I have funeral services, there are things that I have to, I have to remind the people that are there. Death is really just a natural part of life. See, this morning as I woke up this morning and looked out the window, I was reminded of what James talks about in James chapter 4 and verse 17, that life is but a vapor. It appears for a short time, then vanishes away. And as, we looked at, as I looked at, the, at my window this morning, I saw fog over the mountains. And in the early morning, it's bright, it's vibrant, you can see it looks like the whole mountain's on fire. No wonder they call it the Smokies. But then as the day goes long, and the sun rises, and the heat of the day starts coming, now I know heat of the day is relative, 50 is a little warmer than 32. But the fog, it goes away. And such is a life. See, when we're born, we have the vibrance of life. And you look at the little baby, and there's, there's all the joy that comes with it. And as the baby grows and matures, there's a lot of things that happen to that baby. And at some point in time, that baby gets to enter eternity. It's not a baby anymore. And that's really what life is like. If we're here for a short time, and then we enter a place called eternity, have you sat and thought about if we live to be a hundred years old, what is that to the fraction of time that we've been on this earth? I mean, just think about it. In the earth, you know, you take the, a small day, 8,000 years, 100 years isn't very much. If you take eternity based on a hundred years, that's even less. And that's really something to think about, isn't it? See, the thing about death is I, I cannot tell you exactly what it feels like to die. I've never been there. I don't know. I have no idea. But there's something on the other side of that that we can look forward to. And that's what we got to look at. See, when we look at he uh, Hebrews in chapter 9, the Hebrews writer gives us gives us something that we have to come to grips with. See, notice what he says. Hebrews chapter 9, starting in verse 27, it says, And it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. Now, there's a comment. We're, not, we're going to go to the next one, but I want us to think about that. I need us to, to really understand that statement. That we may cheat death today, and we might cheat death tomorrow. But eventually, we're never going to outrun it. It's going to catch up with us. We're not that fast. We're not that rich. We're not made that well. Eventually, it will catch up to us, and we will die. It's appointed that we taste death one time. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who will eagerly wait for him, he will come appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. And as we think about the life that we have here, if we have the hundred years, we have a hundred years to prepare. 
We have a hundred years to prepare for the time when Jesus comes back. But sadly, we all don't get to make it that far, do we? The lady that passed away the other day was 56 years old. She barely made it over 50% of that. And so when we think about life, there's something that we have to focus on. We have to understand that death is a reality. But those who die in, the, <clears throat> die in the Lord, according to Psalm 116, are precious in His sight. But notice how Jesus explains, explains what He's getting ready to go through in John 14 and something they get to look forward to because of what Jesus has done. See, John 14, starting in verse 1, he said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And he said, well, why, would he, why would their heart be troubled? Somebody's going to betray him. He's already told them that. Peter's going to deny them. He already told them that. They're going to be scattered around like sheep without a shepherd. He already told them that. Those are troubling ideas. But you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, ideas, many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And the idea with that is, through his death, he made a means for them to, to be able to make it to heaven, to the Father. At the ultimate resurrection day, when all the dead come forward and they all get gathered together with Jesus, and he gets to take them home, he's made a way for that to happen. And it's through him by his son, and through him by Jesus, his sacrifice. Through his sacrifice, we get to go there. And so on this side of that, death can be scary because we never have died and come back. We haven't died yet. But it's the other side of death that we have to focus on. Because every single one of us eventually is going to cross that river from today to eternity. And not one of us is going to escape it. And because of that, we've got to make preparation. See, when we think about the things that, that frighten us, it could be snakes, mice, spiders, flying, heights, it could be cleaning, you know, if people are afraid of that. It could be a lot of different things that could make us afraid. But when it comes to our spiritual lives, nothing should make us afraid. See, the idea of our past sins, Jesus died to have those sins washed away. When we put on, on, on baptism, we're freed from our penalty of our sins, the, the reigning of our sins, the authority of our sins. We're free from that. We don't have to live that way anymore. That's another way we could put it. Fear of other people, if they don't like Jesus, they're not going to like us. And it's not that we have to go out and be belligerent or trying to cause trouble or just trying to ruin their day. We don't have to be that way. Sometimes all we've got to say is, I live for Jesus, and that's all it takes. Well, we can't fear that because we respect someone greater, somebody else's opinion of us greater than theirs. Death. Death's assurity is going to happen. We're all going to taste it once. And even though we don't know what that looks like and what that's going to feel like, there's a life after this life that we get to look forward to. If you're ready for it. Today, what is your life like? Are you ready for that day to come? If you're a Christian and you're not living the way you ought to, today's the day to repent, pray, and come back. If you not yet put Christ on a baptism for the forgiveness or remission, the sending of all of your sins, you can do that today. But as we're being honest, we're talking about fears. You know, there's many people who's afraid to take the first step. They don't want to step out. They're afraid what will happen and what other people will think. What life will be like once I step out and I come forward? Can I even make it up there? That might be a question some people may ask. If that is your fear today, I'll tell you this. If you let me know you want me to come get you, all you got to do is raise that hand. You don't have to walk it alone. Today, you don't have to live in fear because Jesus died for you. If you have a decision to make, you can make it through standing this song. 
of invitation.